In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Almighty God, we ask your blessings upon all gathered here. We gather to learn your will for us through the teachings of the Second Vatican Council. Guide us always in your love, and lead us all to eternal life through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So welcome to uh, St. Procopius Abbey. And besides welcoming you on behalf of the monks here, I do also want to welcome you on behalf of our co-sponsors for this uh, talk tonight. So that would be uh, Benedictine University, and I believe Dr. Tim Marin's here representing the university, and then also the Lumen Christi Institute. And John Bookman is here representing uh, the Lumen Christi Institute. We have some tables in the back, so please feel free to look at what's back there, take some material on your way out. This is our fifth talk in the Documents of Vatican II lecture series. There are two ideas behind this lecture series. The first is that the documents of the Second Vatican Council are a great gift to the Church from the Holy Spirit. In a world that is changing in profound ways, the documents of Vatican II can guide the Church through these changes so that she continues to bring the light of Christ to the nations. Second, in order to be guided by the Second Vatican Council, we need to know the Council's documents themselves. One here is much talk about Vatican II, but not many are familiar with the documents themselves. This lecture series wants to help remedy that. Tonight's talk focuses on the document Dei Verbum, meaning Word of God in Latin. And this is the Council's dogmatic constitution on divine revelation. Although an initial outline for this document was presented early in the Council, the outline was dramatically revised and the document was completed and promulgated towards the end of the Council in 1965. I'm happy to have with us Dr. Matthew Levering to present on Dei Verbum. Dr. Levering is the James N. and Mary D. Perry Jr. Chair of Theology at the University of St. Mary of the Lake, more commonly known, of course, as Mundelein Seminary. A convert to Catholicism from Quakerism, Dr. Levering received a BA from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, a Master's of Theological Studies from Duke University, and his PhD from Boston College. Also, he and his wife Joy are the proud parents of six children. Dr. Levering is a prolific author, having written about 20 books and having edited about 15 collections of essays. He is a student of St. Thomas Aquinas who also is widely read in other authors and in many topics. One of the benefits I have found of reading his books is that you get a good introduction into major figures and important themes in the given topic. Most recently, Dr. Levering has been studying and writing upon the Second Vatican Council. His book, Engaging the Doctrine of Revelation, is inspired and guided by Dei Verbum, while also addressing important issues and authors on the topic of God's revelation to human beings. Along with Father Matthew Lamb, he has also edited a collection of essays titled The Reception of Vatican II. And that work is coming out, might have already actually, it was listed as coming out in March uh, next month, from the U Oxford University Press. Also, Dr. Levering has authored a book titled An Introduction to Vatican II as an Ongoing Theological Event, which will be published in the coming months from the Catholic University of America Press. So tonight, Dr. Levering will present his talk titled Dei Verbum, Persons and Propositions. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Matthew Levering. Uh, thank you so much, Abbot Austin. I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, so now the, one of the best parts of this talk is the, is the PowerPoint. So I, I think the abbot is going to control the PowerPoint. And even, even if you can't read the PowerPoint, just know that it probably is the best part of the talk. And so, you know, so the, the, the best part of the talk is there uh, for, for later. Uh. But my, my talk begins um, with the figure of Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict the 16th of Emeritus. And I begin with him because he was present at the council, and so he can help us see what was the major concern um, behind the um, prom promulgation, behind the, the drafting of Dave Verbum. So I'm going to begin with him, 
And I'm going to begin in 1967, a commentary he wrote after the Council on Dave Abram. I'm also going to talk about something he wrote in 1992. And then eventually I'm going to get to Dave Verbum, but I have to admit, there you're going to really need your handout because um, I'm going to quote a good bit from Dave Verbum. And, um, and I think Dave Verbum has, has probably written in a more inter interesting style than my own quotation from Dave Verbum, so you'll, need to, you'll definitely need to be um, looking at, at that handout, I, I suspect. Dave Verbum has its roots in a widespread determination shared by the young Joseph Ratzinger and other leading theologians of the Council to replace a propositionalist understanding of Revelation, which is Revelation as a set of just revealed truths, with a personalist understanding of Revelation as a dynamic encounter with the living Lord and therefore as a transformative, as transformative of the whole person rather than solely engaging the intellect. In critiquing propositionalism, Ratzinger and his friends sought to highlight the central place of Scripture and its dialogue between the people of God and, and, and God himself, the living God of Israel. As Ratzinger and his friends sought to highlight this dialogue as fundamental for the ongoing life of the Church. Thus, in his 1967 commentary, which I mentioned on Dave Verbum, Ratzinger remarks that, quote, one of the most important events in the struggle over the Constitution on Revelation was undoubtedly the liberation from this narrow uh, previous view. Now he's talking about um, only the past previous year means um, maybe the past 75 years or whatever. Um, and the return, he says, the return to what actually happens in the positive sources, such as Scripture, before it was crystallized into doctrine, when God reveals himself. So think of like the burning bush or things like that. In the same place, Ratzinger bemoans, quote, how little intellectualism and doctrinalism are able to comprehend the nature of revelation, which is not concerned with talking about something that is quite external to the person, but rather with the realization of the existence of man, with the relation of the human eye to the divine thou. So against intellectualism and doctrinalism, which imagine that divine revelation aims solely to deliver doctrinal truths, Ratzinger in 1967 states that, quote, the purpose of this dialogue made possible by revelation is ultimately not information, but transformation and unity. Unity with God and unity with each other. Now I'm going to turn to a contrast, though, something of a contrast. Not, not a complete contrast, but something of a contrast. But by contrast, in his 1992 remarks announcing the promulgation of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, Joseph Ratzinger defends this propositional setting forth of the Church's teaching that we find in a catechism. A catechism really is it's propositional. It's um, a set of um, propositions or ideas. Emphasizing the personal revelation that's the source of the catechism's propositions, Ratzinger observes, this is while he was a cardinal, that the catechism draws its answers to the basic questions of human life from, quote, observations transcending the merely human, observations that transmit what was seen and heard by men who were in contact with God himself. So, the, so think of the original revelation and then the transmission of that revelation. And the catechism then built its propositions on, on that basis. Defending the catechism from the charge that its teachings fail to appreciate the time-bound and contextualized character of all expressions of faith, Ratzinger emphasizes that the Church speaks about God and about humanity, well, of course, speaks propositionally, on the basis of God's self-revelation in Christ as communicated faithfully in Scripture and tradition. 
he states that, quote, we cannot speak rightly about God unless God himself tells us who he is, and he argues that the catechism is, quote, is able to make all its affirmations about our moral conduct only in the perspective of God, the God who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. So they are the personal, strongly emphasizing the personal, but yet also the propositional, because the catechism is a propositional, a handbook of, of ideas. Now, again, this was more interesting, this paper would have been more interesting had I written it in 1992, because, um, unfortunately I didn't, but um, it would have been more interesting then because there was a very much, a very passionate controversy about the catechism. It was seen as going back to a propositionalist view of our relationship to, to the living God. Now, this, it was seen this way before it was published. There was a major controversy before the publication when no one had really read the catechism yet. It, it was really felt that you couldn't write a catechism. You know, that was something that you did, that the church did in the past, but not, not, not now. So that was a major controversy, but the controversy um, dissipated uh, now, now um, the catechism really is, um, you know, is, is, has really has been well received. So Ratzinger had advocated for a universal catechism since the 1970s, and during the extraordinary synod of 80, 1985, the assembled bishops voted to commission a universal catechism. This was 20 years after the council. In explaining the bishop's decision, Ratzinger recalls a conversation from the early post-conciliar period in which Hans Urs von Balthasar, another well-known theologian, advised Ratzinger, quote, do not presuppose the faith, but propose it. This advice was something of an awakening for Ratzinger at the time, presumably because he'd always lived in a very strong Catholic culture. What he learned from von Balazar, he says, was that, quote, faith is not maintained automatically. It's not a finished business that we can simply take for granted. The life of faith has to be constantly renewed, end quote. This insight seems surprisingly simple, but Ratzinger suggests that after the council, a number of bishops came in various ways to the same awakening that Balazar's letter had triggered for Ratzinger. He states, quote, the bishops present at the 1985 Synod called for this universal catechism of the whole church because they sensed precisely what Balazar had put into words in his note to me, end quote. In sum, the purpose of the catechism was, quote, to propose the faith by instructing believers about the content, really the propositional content here, of divine revelation as handed on in the Church under the guidance of the Holy Spirit through Scripture and tradition, because um, it was felt the fundamental propositional content of Catholic faith was in danger of being neglected, obscured, and forgotten. In short, by comparison with the Catechism's historical context, in which the bishops deemed that a propositional restatement of the content of Catholic faith was urgently necessary, the context of the Second Vatican Council's dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, which we're dealing with today, De Verbum, was largely the opposite. Ratzinger's remarks in 1967 and 1992 remind us, I think, and this is really the, these, this is the thesis of my paper, so this is all that you need to remember. The rest of it is a yada, 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 pretty much. Uh, I have to admit that. Uh, so it reminds us that, that both the personal dimension of revelation and the cognitive or propositional dimension are necessary. So both are necessary. As Gerald of Collins has shown, in accord with Ratzinger's own view, the cognitive propositional dimension is enfolded within the personal dimension of divine revelation. Quote, the interpersonal dialogue, which is God's self-communication, says and communicates information through encountering the divine truth in person. Human beings know truths. End quote. O'Connor's formulation carefully balances the personal and cognitive or propositional elements of divine revelation, showing they must be inseparable 
if, in fact, any real revelation has occurred. Just as one finds in Scripture itself, O'Collins gives primacy to the dimension of personal encounter. Quote, Revelation for Dave Verbum primarily means meeting the mystery of God in person, and then only secondarily knowing divine mysteries. O'Collins contrasts this position with Vatican I, for example, um, its document, De, De, its constitution, De Filius, which in his words understands, quote, divine revelation to be primarily God communicating propositional truths, um, the divine the, the propositional truths about God. De Filius, of course, had its own context. So each of the, one of the lessons here is that each, each of these um, church documents has to be uh, seen in its own context. Its context was the 19th century um, currents of thought that denied the existence and even the possibility of any sort of cognitively knowable and necessary supernatural revelation, any possibility of God speaking. And of course, O'Collins strongly defends um, that possibility. So um, that's the con- I was speaking there of the context of De Filius, the 19th century. Um, uh, document from Vatican I. Now, our, our topic is De Verbum, uh, Vatican II. But the question of the relationship of personal re- self-revelation and cognitive propositional content governs further positions that theologians take today with regard to whether scripture and dogma can adequately, even, of course, never exhaustively, express divine revelation. So what I call elsewhere, the ongoing theological event of Dei Verbum consists centrally in the effort to understand how this person, dimension of personal encounter and the dimension of, of propositional cognition or dogma relate in the revelation of divine mysteries. Put succinctly, a problem today is that many theologians, at least, no longer believe in cognitively knowable divine revelation, as it were, a deposit of faith, an apostolic deposit, to which we owe um, what Paul calls the obedience of faith. That's from Romans 1. So to help us understand what Dave Verbum teaches on this matter, I'm going to survey the first 11 paragraphs of Dave Verbum with a relationship of personal existential encounter and cognitive propositional content in view. The result should be twofold. First, a greater understanding of the actual content of Dei Verbum. That's, that's part of the goal of the lecture, really. And second, an appreciation of how Dei Verbum balances Revelation's two aspects, a personal encounter and propositional intelligibility, or the, um, the simile that we understand what, what we learn uh, um, from, from God. Okay, now, now I have... I realize that I haven't talked about my PowerPoints, but I have them here. Um, I'm going to briefly, just very briefly, um, touch upon what the PowerPoints uh, said. So it, it begins kind of with some context about Dave Verbum. You know, it was promulgated in, right at the end of the council in um, 1965, about um, you know 50 years ago. Um, but then, then it really focuses on this point that Dave Verbum is working against the context of that time, which was very propositionalist, so that Catholic faith was understood simply as just affirming some truths. So it was about the mind affirming truths. And it was certainly, just the young Joseph Ratzinger felt that that was, Catholic faith had been reduced to that in some contexts. Now that's, um, you know, obviously Catholic faith was always much richer than that, but, but that was a concern that they had. Um, so. Um, the emphasis in Dave Verbum is on the personal encounter with the living Lord that's possible for you and me today, and that's the heart of our faith, is that in personal encounter. But the um, question then becomes, well, what about propositions? How does, what are, what are they? Um, and so it, um, essentially after the council or during that period, there, um, among, some, among some thinkers, they developed a very negative view of, of propositions. So, so let me just kind of run down some 
a contrast here. This was one of the um, one of the PowerPoints. The contrast is like the personal is experiential. The personal is um, personal encounter. It's heart. It's love. It's relationship. It's transformative. And so that's the personal. And of course, Dave Abram is really bringing that back and emphasizing it. Now, it was never really um, lost, but but it was um, perhaps underestimated. Um, so. Now contrast that with what, what associations come to your mind when you think of propositional. Um, and this was on the PowerPoint. It, when you think of pro propositional, you might think of intellectual. That sounds bad already. And then, but you might think also of um, abstract idea, mind, truth, thought. Um, and you might think of uninspiring. That might be another idea. So, um, so you can see this, this contrast of personal encounter and propositional. But the question then in the next PowerPoint was, is it really an either or? Or is, are we dealing here with a both and? And so the point um, was, does personal encounter really, is it really possible without, without propositional knowing, without thinking? Do propositions really belong to personal encounter? And so I, I gave some propositions. For example, um, you know, when you're having a personal encounter, when, um, as, as a married man, I have a personal encounter with my wife, and it, it's very important that I have a proposition in my mind. I need, to, I need to have in my mind, as I'm having a personal encounter, that person is my wife. You, you see? There has to be some, pro some cognitive knowledge, some propositional content in order to have a real personal encounter with a person um, who is one's own wife. And so, um, so really trying to emphasize that these two belong together. But um, just in case you can't read the PowerPoint, you know, essentially my thesis is that Dave Arabum, it really does emphasize um, that what is our faith about? It's about a personal union, a personal encounter with the living Lord Jesus Christ. But again, that's not to the detriment of actual knowledge about who that living Lord is and propositional content, simply ideas in our mind ideas that we are given um, through the church, through scripture, that are true, um, through, through dogma, um, that help us uh, have that personal encounter. Without these ideas, we could never really encounter Jesus as he truly is. Um, so the two aspects go very profoundly together. That's, that's the point of the, of the, of the um, paper here. Um, gosh, should I read the rest of the paper? I've already, I've given it away. Uh, but don't worry, y'all. I, I am going to read at least a good bit of the rest of the paper. The main point here is we're going to kind of run through some of these paragraphs, and we're going to see how Dave Verbum itself gives us this very beautiful balance between the personal and the propositional. And again, why are we so concerned about this balance? Well, we're concerned about it because in the context of Dave Verbum, which I um, brought forward through um, the words of Joseph Ratzinger, there was very much a concern about a propositionalist understanding of faith. But perhaps it's possible that in our own context, we tend to be negative toward propositions, and um, you know we think maybe that the important thing is the encounter with Jesus, so the dogmas or the ideas about Jesus are, are not as important. Um, that's, our, that's our context. It wasn't Dave Verbum's context. But so we want to emphasize then in this, in this, um, this paper that the two go together, and, and we want to see how Dave Verbum uh, really um, helps us understand that. So the prologue of Dave Verbum, we're going to begin with a prologue. It places the entire document under the rubric of a deeply personal understanding, and historical understanding of divine revelation. At the same time, it doesn't negate the place of propositional truth. And we see this because the Council Fathers describe themselves as, this is how they begin, as hearing the Word of God with reverence and proclaiming it with faith. So to hear and proclaim something in faith surely requires the expression of revealed truths to which the mind assents as true. Yet the Council's Fathers the Council Fathers' stance vis-a-vis -vis the Word of God is resonant of personal relationship, of ongoing encounter and event. The biblical quotation that immediately follows this opening of Dei Verbum cements the sense of revelation as an experiential encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and thereby also as a fellowship with the Holy Trinity, who unites the community of believers. The biblical text comes from 1 John 1, 2 to 3, and I'm, I'll read it since it's one of my favorite ones. It's right at the opening of De Verbum. We proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen with our own and, and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. This sense of personal encounter with the self-revealing Word is intensified um, by the first verse of 1 John 1, which is implied in, in what was quoted. And that first verse is also so profound. It says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the Word of life. You can see a very deeply personal sense of, of divine revelation. So revelation as word, testimony, encounter could not be more evident here. This dimension of revelation stands at the center of De Verbum. At the same time, the fact that revelation contains definite revealed truths also receives intention in the first paragraphs. For example, the council fathers go on to present themselves as following in the steps of the councils of Trent and Vatican I. And both of those councils are known for defining particular truths of faith that belong to the deposit, the apostolic deposit of divine revelation. For example, doctrines regarding the Eucharist, justification, faith and reason, um, and so forth. The dual recognition that revelation is a personal encounter that involves fellowship and that revelation contains cognitive content that demands our assent marks the prologue of De Verbum. Now, let me turn to the next five paragraphs of De Verbum, um, two to six. Paragraphs two to six. These paragraphs exhibit the ways in which personal encounter and communion and the communication of cognitive content are integrally united. So drawing upon, let me just give a few examples. Drawing upon Ephesians 1.9. De Verbum 2, paragraph 2, states, It pleased God in his goodness and wisdom to reveal himself and to make known the mystery of his will. So in revealing himself, surely he has to reveal truths about himself. You know, same way as when you meet, meet a human, human person, they, they start telling you about their background, and you get, get to know them in that way. Just as in making known the mystery of his will, God makes known truths about God's plan for humanity, for salvation. Now, at the same time, though, the phrase, the mystery of his will, comes from Ephesians 1.9 and includes a transformative dimension, the personal dimension of divine revelation. As Dave Verbum, paragraph 2, observes, quote, his will was that men should have access to the Father through Christ, the Word made flesh, and the Holy Spirit and thus become shares in the divine nature. So revelation fundamentally transforms us, you and me, and it draws us into divine communion. That's the whole point. This emphasis on revelation as, as a real friendship with God, a, establishing a friendship, appears in the next sentence of Dave Verbum, um, paragraph 2. Quote, By this revelation, then, the invisible God from the fullness of his love, addresses men as his friends and moves among them in order to invite and receive them into his own company. Nothing can be more intimate than that. I think we got Dave Verbum 2 pretty well nailed down. So we've got to jump to Dave Verbum uh, 3. So if Christ is the fullness of revelation, however, why did God not give this friendship earlier? or in a more universally decisive fashion. You know, why, 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 why be so particular about it that it just comes in a particular place, in a particular time, in the, middle of, in the middle of human history, and so forth? What about all the people who never heard of Christ, or who, despite hearing about him, have not come to know him as he truly is? 
Dave Abram 3, paragraph 3, indicates that God's self-revealing presence has never been lacking among humans. Since all things are created through the Word, it makes sense that creatures point toward God. God, quote, provides men with constant evidence of himself in created realities, end quote. The revelation of God's friendship with us in Christ builds upon the fact that the Creator has willed to make his presence known. Indeed, the gift of grace was never absent in human history. So there's always been the personal. There's always been that. But Dave Ehrman III insists that, quote, wishing to open up the way to heavenly salvation, God manifested himself to our first parents from the very beginning. After the fall, he buoyed them up with the hope of salvation by promising redemption in Genesis 3.15, as it's traditionally read. And he's never ceased, he, God, God has never ceased to take care of the human race, end quote. So while unfolding in a particular history of God's people Israel and culminating in the work of their Messiah, the invitation to friendship with the triune God is a work that always has had all peoples in view and that never has excluded them, never excludes them. God shows his love for humanity, though, in a fully historical manner, appreciating human particularity. God acts in and through specific people, and not by some sort of universal divine fiat or by some sort of PowerPoint in, in the sky, in the cosmos, some sort of PowerPoint up there in the stars. The revelation that God of God, of course, is not exclusionary. And so Dave Verma III points out that God, quote, wishes to give eternal life to all those who seek salvation by patience in well-doing. And it cites here Romans 2. Now, Dave Verma IV explains how Jesus, though, is the fullness of divine revelation and how Jesus really teaches us um, who God is. For one thing, Jesus reveals saving truths about God. So there's the propositional element. Namely, Jesus is, quote, the eternal word who enlightens all men. And he came, quote, to dwell among men and to tell them about the inner life of God. So there's cognitive or propositional communication. In addition to his words, Jesus reveals God by his deeds. Since Jesus reveals God and God's will for us by everything he does, quote, by the total fact of his presence and self-manifestation, end quote, especially by his cross and resurrection and his sending of the Spirit, Dave Erebum IV notes that Jesus confirms revelation, quote, with divine guarantees. Now, if someone asks where or what is divine revelation, we can point them to Jesus. Jesus is divine revelation because his words and deeds reveal the personal presence of the Son and also because to see Jesus is to see the Father. That's a quotation from Dave Verbum uh, pointing to John 14. So according to Dave Verbum 4, Jesus not only teaches us, quote, about the inner life of God, but also reveals, quote, that God is with us to deliver us from darkness, darkness of sin and death, and to raise us up to eternal life. Jesus reveals these saving truths by his words and deeds and fundamentally by his ongoing presence with us. So again, the, the propositional words, but also his own deeds and his ongoing presence, um, including his presence with his apostles, his disciples. Now, to turn to the next paragraph, Dave, Dave Urban 5. Here we find the necessity of responding to the self-revealing God with the obedience of faith. That's Romans 1 and Romans 16. This obedience assent requires that there be propositionally knowable revelation to which to assent. So otherwise, one couldn't assent obediently to Jesus since one would have literally no idea what Jesus' presence means. You know, that's the value of, of, of ideas. You know, if we don't know who Jesus is, we can't really welcome him in, in our hearts and our minds. So at the same time, this cognitive ascent requires deeply intimate personal relationship. Along these lines, Dave Verbum V develops the importance of the Holy Spirit's work. Because the content of Revelation is a divine mystery, 
which means above reason's capabilities to exhaustively judge, the ascent of faith comes about only when the grace of the Holy Spirit moves the will, moves us interiorly. Revelation involves conversion and transformation. The Holy Spirit transforms us. That's the main point here. So that we really love, and and we love what we are ascending to, which is namely the person of Jesus. Relationship with God stands at the center, then, of both Revelation's content and the way in which we make Revelation our own. Through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we receive, quote, an ever-deepening understanding of Revelation. So that's Revelation, that's Dave Verbum 5, um, now Dave Verbum 6. Dave Verbum 6 also combines the propositional and the personal. That's not going to surprise you by now. That's my argument. Um, consider this sentence from Dave Verbum 6. Quote, By divine revelation, God wished to manifest and communicate both himself and the eternal decrees of his will concerning the salvation of humankind. End quote. In manifesting and communicating himself, which God does both through the prophet's teaching and through the incarnation of his son and, and his sending of his spirit, God displays the, the deep personal intimacy characteristic of Revelation. That's the primary. But at the same time, the personal intimacy involves cognitive or propositional communication. And we see that because when God communicates his, quote, eternal decrees, the emphasis falls upon the cognitive content. Since decrees must be knowable, things that, that we can understand. Now, God does this, of course, by communicating himself in the person of Jesus. So, Dave Abram 6 quotes two central texts from chapter 2 of Vatican I's Dei Filius, in which Dei Filius insists upon human reason's natural ability to know God as first principle and final end of all things, while also affirming that our present, in our present fallen condition, even such natural knowledge of God must be revealed for us to have any easy access to God. And so the propositional emphasis of Dei Filius is folded into this paragraph of Dei Verbum, uh, emphasizing the personal mode in which we come to know God fully. Now, beginning with paragraph 7, Dei Verbum shifts its attention to the transmission of divine revelation. This is chapter 2. Chapter 2 of Divine of um, Dei Verbum. So here, too, we find the same appreciation for revealed truths, propositional, and for personal presence. For example, Dei Verbum 7 states that the gospel entrusted to the apostles is, quote, the source of all saving truth. At the same time, the apostles communicate the gospel not only by teaching truths, and they certainly do teach such truths, but also by the example of their lives and by, quote, the institutions they established, end quote. So their communication of saving truth, a communion, draws upon both what Jesus taught them when they shared in his life and ministry and what the Holy Spirit teaches them now. Their personal relationship with Christ and the Spirit enables them to communicate in writing and in oral teaching what they receive from the lips of Christ, from his way of life and his works, and also from the Spirit. So this is, that's, that's a propositional um, communication that's rooted in a personal. So with regard to the personal relationship or fellowship with God that fuels all this, Dave Barabum 7 remarks, quote, This sacred tradition, then, and the sacred scripture of both Testaments are like a mirror in which the Church, during its pilgrim journey, here on earth, contemplates God, from whom she receives everything until such time as she's brought to see him face to face. So personal encounter and cognitive propositional here are inseparable. Again, the the point. Turning to paragraph 8. The example that I, that I give here um, comes from the description of the church's communion and a believer's, quote, intimate sense of the spiritual realities which they experience. Alongside the same paragraph's affirmation that, quote, what was handed on by the apostles comprises everything 
that serves to make the people of God live their lives in holiness and increase their faith. Clearly, what was handed on involves and includes doctrinal and moral teachings, revealed truths, so the propositional element. But Dave Erbum 8 also speaks of the ongoing development in the Church's understanding of these truths. Um, and of course, this ongoing development um, doesn't rupture or contradict what was understood before, but, but deepens it. Um, quote, the Church is always advancing toward the plenitude of divine truth. End quote. Um, rather than a mere growth in the number of apprehended truths, though, that's not what the point is. It's not a mere growth in just a number, like the Church knows more and more, um, more truths. What development is, the growth really occurs as, quote, God continues to converse with the spouse of his beloved son. So an ongoing dialogue, an ongoing dialogue with, with the faithful, um, faithful believers uh, through the activity of the Spirit. So it's not solely a matter of the Church getting the truths right, although the Church does this. I mean, otherwise, otherwise the dialogue, you know, would essentially be um, a conversation based on misunderstanding. You know, like when you, when you have a conversation with someone and then all of a sudden at the end you realize that you're talking past each other and you haven't really um, communicated. No, it's, it's not that kind of dialogue. It's, it's a, um, a dialogue under the Holy Spirit's guidance. Where, um, where true transformation and true understanding um, occur and deepen as the relationship develops. So, Dave Verbum 9, let me, let me move to, um, to Dave Verbum 9. Here we find, again, an understanding of Scripture that unites cognitive expression or propositional with the personal presence and activity of God. Gosh, I noticed that the opening sentences of all these paragraphs are the same. I, I apologize for that. My, my own uh, writing here. The paragraph states, uh, paragraph 9, quote, Sacred Scripture is the speech of God as it is put down in writing under the breath of the Holy Spirit. That's something there. You know. So there is propositional. The inspired human words of Scripture are associated with the Spirit's breath and God's speaking. So there's personal also. A highly personal way of formulating God's relationship with the written words of the Bible in which, as you know, God gives commandments and prophetic promises, along with ample doctrinal and moral teaching found throughout Scripture. By the Spirit's breath, God speaks personally in human words. Thus, personal divine communication and the propositional form that it takes are shown to be a unity. The process of tradition by which the entirety of the Word of God is handed on, also involves the enlightenment of the apostles and their successors by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. Again, no opposition between the propositional and the personal. So, turning to paragraph 10, uh, let's see. In paragraph 10, um, tradition and scripture are are described as a single deposit. uh, That's a single sacred deposit of the Word of God which is entrusted to the Church. So this very notion of a sacred deposit, a deposit of faith that's binding, that's authoritative, it indicates a determinative, propositional, cognitive content, which may be more than, but certainly is not less than, a body of truths. In this paragraph, which looks back to Acts 2.42, and thus implicitly also to Acts 20, 18 to 35, the magisterium of the Church is accorded the role of definitive interpreter of the sacred deposit of divine revelation. Here, then, it might seem that we are encountering revelation understood solely as a body of truths, solely propositionally, unfolded by the Church's magisterium through dogmatic formulations over the centuries. However, and of course, I'm not, I'm not denying that that, um, that takes place. But however, Dave Verbum 10 takes pains to describe, quote, the living teaching office, the magisterium of the church in a profoundly relational and um, in its reception and handing on a divine revelation. The magisterium appears as the servant of the word of God. And the magisterium's acts of listening to, guarding, and expounding the revealed deposit take place, quote, at the divine command and with the help of the Holy Spirit. So the point is, in paragraph 10, 
it's within a personal matrix of, um, th that the church's magisterium performs its service of handing on um, of revealed truths. So again, not, not in any way downplaying the reality of revealed truths and development in, in, those, um, in that understanding of truth, but always in a personal context. Paragraph 11 starts a new chapter on the inspiration and interpretation of Scripture. And Dave Irwin 11 places the focus squarely on personal realities. It presents the church as a personal reality rather than a mere institution, describing the church as Holy Mother Church. As paragraph 11 says, the whole of Scripture, including all its parts, is sacred. And all of it has God as its author, since the Spirit inspires the whole of Scripture. Recognizing Scripture's rootedness, quote, in the faith of the apostolic age, which is the faith of the Church, the Church receives and accepts Scripture as it has been handed on in the Church, namely, as divinely inspired and canonical. Paragraph 11 goes on to note that the human authors of Scripture who were chosen by God wrote in a fully human way and were true authors, even though God, quote, acted in them and by them. God's agency inspiring and guiding the development of the biblical canon doesn't mean that the human authors were not real authors, were not men of their time. It does mean, however, that everything in Scripture belongs there as God's Word. So understood properly. Um, and and um, paragraph 11 um, says this, that God ensured that the human authors, without ceasing to be fully human, quote, consigned to writing whatever he wanted written and no more. Here, the personal intimacy of God inspiring these human authors and the emphasis on, on truths of faith communicated by the biblical writings um, link tightly the personal and the propositional. Regarding the truth of Scripture, paragraph 11 goes on to say that, quote, all, the ins all that the inspired authors or sacred writers affirm should be regarded as affirmed by the Holy Spirit. This focuses attention on the propositional judgments of the human authors, but it also emphasizes the immediacy of our scriptural encounter with the Holy Spirit. As we read Scripture, we encounter God. We read Scripture to encounter God. That's, that's the purpose of reading Scripture. The same balance between personal and transformative, on the one hand, and, and cognitive and propositional, on the other, appears in paragraphs 11 that, on um, paragraph 11's affirmation that, quote, the books of Scripture firmly, faithfully, and without error teach the truth that which God, for the sake of our salvation, wish to see confided in the sacred scriptures. God meets us in scripture for the sake of our salvation. The purpose of scriptural truth is transformation and salvation. So coming to know truths is transformative, and it's for that personal fellowship with the God who meets us there in Christ. Paragraph 11 supports this point by quoting 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, quote, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. End quote. That's from 2 Timothy. Now, I've, I've reached my conclusion. I'm not going to go through the... There are um, 13 or, or so more paragraphs of Dave Irwin, but I'm, I'm bagging all of those because um, just for the purpose of a short talk. Um, and I'm just going to... I'll just give a brief paragraph of conclusion. Writing in 1966, the Jesuit theologian René Latourelle was struck by Dave Verbum's presentation of Jesus as the one, quote, who reveals the mystery and is the mystery himself in person. This personalist approach to revelation, to Jesus Christ, ensures the transformative power of divine revelation. Rather than allowing us to conceive of revelation simply in terms of a set of doctrinal propositions to which we must assent intellectually. Yet, Latourelle is clear that the personal and propositional are not in any opposition here, but rather must be held together. He observes with regard to Dave Reverend 5, 
The Council, this is a quotation, the Council thus avoids two incomplete conceptions of faith. Two incomplete conceptions of faith. First, that of faith homage, personal but without content. And second, that of faith assent, doctrinal but depersonalized. End quote. This integrated balance between the personal and the doctrinal is crucial. Mats Wahlberg, a contemporary theologian, has pointed out that it's impossible for our minds to know anything if we utterly lack propositional knowledge. We, we then are just simply empty. Our minds register nothing. For example, we can't even have a personal encounter with God if the encounter lacks at least the basic propositional knowledge that it is God whom we are encountering. Catholic theologians have always recognized that revealed mysteries can never be expressed exhaustively in any finite propositions, in, in any exhaustive way, right? But according to Dave Verbum, the Church over the centuries, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, has articulated certain truths that pertain to the apostolic deposit of faith. And, and of course, Catholics today, guided by that same Spirit, do assent to these saving truths, and, and thus assent to the authority of the person of Jesus Christ over our lives with an obedience of faith. Thank you so much.